welcome to China Econ Talk. I'm here today with Charlie Mosley, an American game developer based in Chengdu. Um, on his LinkedIn page, it says that he seeks to elevate East Asian organizations to a higher level of operational quality, empowering them to compete with larger overseas rivals. Hi, Charlie, and welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for inviting me. We also have a co-host today, uh, Zhang Rong R, otherwise known as Polly, who is a Beida classmate of mine and a previous intern at NetEase, uh, which is one of China's largest internet companies, which also produces it, its own games and has a music app that I think is uh, superior to Spotify. So, Polly, great to have you. Uh, great to have you on today as well. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So um, before we jump into the gaming side of this conversation, I'm I'm curious, Charlie, if we could hear a little bit about your China story and what first brought you to uh, uh, to the Middle Kingdom. I came to China specifically seeking the strangest place on earth, um, and it seemed like China fit the bill. So I got on a plane and went to Hong Kong first uh, via Tokyo, actually brief trip through Japan, and then found my way to Chengdu, where I had a Canadian friend who was living here. And uh, basically, just seeking adventure. Essentially, um, I worked in the tech industry before I came to China. Um, I'm also a musician, so the, for, actually, the first couple of years that I was in China, I was just a DJ. So I was touring around China for a couple of years, and then felt like I was done doing that, and got back into technology, and co-founded a game company here in Chengdu. Did that for five years, and then left that company, joined another one two years ago, and that's uh, basically the one-minute story of my. Uh, Traveling to China. So, what first drew you to games, and what do you think is you know really unique about the medium that has really caught on uh, worldwide over the past you know ten, fifteen, twenty years or so? Well, my father got a Nintendo Entertainment System when I was five years old, when it was brand new, and so my first exposure to games was the first Super Mario Brothers. And I grew up with games. Anyone in my generation, pretty much, who are American, especially. Grew up around games just like I did, so I grew up with the Nintendo, the Super Nintendo, the Sega Genesis. All of my friends had these types of games, and so there was an enormous cultural impact that games had on myself and on my peers. At the time, in the 1980s and 1990s, games were widely viewed as sort of a destructive influence. It was the kind of thing that kids wanted to constantly interact with because they're really fixated on the challenge and the intrigue and all these. Very engaging, dynamic elements which interactive games provide. And meanwhile, society and parents were kind of concerned about the destructive effects of games, especially about violent games. And this is a, a you know, controversy which has been renewed because of the Parkland shooting in Florida recently. But I grew up around games, and around uh, 2009, when Apple introduced the iOS App Store, that played a huge role in democratizing software development and game development in particular. As some listeners may know, games uh, comprise about 80% of App Store revenue. And so it's the lion's share of the business of the App Store, which is a multi-billion dollar business. So around 2009, this industry started to be created. And now there are hundreds of thousands or millions of people who are working in the mobile games industry in particular, which didn't exist 10 years ago. So now it's 2008 uh, and 2018, sorry. And in 2008, the mobile games industry didn't exist. So around that time, 2009, 2010 is when this industry started to be created. And we've seen explosive growth ever since then. And China has been one of the chief places where we see this explosive growth. So I was working in technology and around the time that the App Store was introduced, I started working on user interface design for mobile applications, specifically utilities. I did that for about a year with some colleagues here in Chengdu. And after a year, we decided to try out uh, game development. And our first project was successful. And we joined the mobile game industry along with people from all around the world. And the really amazing thing about the App Store is that anyone can participate in this incredible industry, regardless of geographic location. So you have a lot of really uh, notable companies from Helsinki, Finland, and Chengdu, China, and Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, all these disparate places, whereas previously, you know, it was kind of understood that the tech industry was centered and based in Silicon Valley, California, and in these kind of uh, geographic places with a lot of notoriety. So this distribution effect, which the App Store had, kind of made all this possible. And by this, I mean me being a professional in the game industry rather than just a person who plays games. 
Uh, Paula, you want to talk a little bit about your your personal history when it comes to games growing up in uh, in Taiwan and the and the mainland? Mm, I don't think my story is like as interesting as the Charlie one. So, like during my like teen teenager times, I'm the like very normal students who are advised not to play games because mm-hmm. like in the China or like <clears throat> in the total. Oh, in the total, like East Asia society context, you should like work hard and not play games. So I like the kids who are like, really interested in games, but not really like be uh, encouraged by the parents or teachers to play it. So uh, I was studying like history and literature in a college and thinking about my career after graduation. So what could I do um, besides like maybe? Maybe working in a publisher house or like editor or just like writing something I'm thinking about and had other fun things to do. So I searched and found out there are a lot of jobs of like game designers in China nowadays, and they don't only need the people who like has a mathematics backgrounds or know how to like do programming. They also need people who know how to write stories and design the stories for the games, especially like RPG games, which need a lot of like stories and probably historical background or context. So I think my like major could fit into this job uh, requirements. So I applied and interned in uh, NetEase Games and feel like it's what I want to do. So that's what I probably will do. High possibility will do in the future. Yeah. Very cool. So, so Charlie, could you walk us a little bit through how you've seen uh, games in China evolve since you uh, since you settled down here? Yeah. So, my role in the organization which I work in, basically, my role in the Chinese gaming industry is helping Chinese companies overcome uh, generally a lot of the cultural barriers that they usually get stuck up on, which prevent them from competing with companies overseas. So, increasingly, you find. Chinese developers are competing in the international market against companies from America or England or Canada, whereas previously they would kind of just be laughed out of the market because culturally China is incredibly different from the West. So often when we see Chinese companies engage in international markets, they do it in very obtuse, goofy ways. Um, And I have always interpreted my position as helping them overcome those obstacles. And over the last, I would say, three years in particular, we've seen a huge amount of progress in this. Um, If we look at the highest grossing mobile games in the world, about 80% of them are from Asia. And increasingly, a lot of them are from mainland China, specifically. Some of those are from NetEase, actually. NetEase has made a couple of PUBG clones, which I talked about on a couple podcasts recently. One of them was the Technode podcast. Uh, Another one was my podcast, the Chengdu Gaming Federation podcast. And that has been quite a phenomenon as well, seeing mainland game companies create products which are truly global. And in a lot of cases, games which players themselves don't even realize are from China to begin with. Um, In a lot of these games, there's kind of nothing really Chinese in them. They don't look Chinese, they don't sound Chinese, they don't take place in China. They're just international products which happen to come from China. So the fact that China has been able to overcome this hurdle is a pretty significant development in the game industry. Simultaneously, along with that phenomenon, there's another one, which is that foreign games are also becoming popular inside China. And this is also a fairly new development because until pretty recently, all the games which were most successful in China were Chinese games. So they were Chinese games made for Chinese people. And these tended to include a lot of sort of explicit, overt Chinese cultural themes. So there would be games which take place like in uh, you know, Tang Dynasty, China, and they would just be very heavy, you know, Chinese cultural themes. And increasingly, foreign games are finding real success inside China. Uh, Overwatch and League of Legends are two of those. Uh, PUBG is another one of those. So there's a long list of international games which are now becoming very popular inside China. So I guess one way to summarize all of these developments is that we're starting to see some of these walls come down. Some of the walls which would keep Chinese games inside China or they would keep foreign games outside China. So why do you think, um, or, or what were the what were the mistakes you saw three or four years ago, and and why are these uh, companies being able to learn so fast and and create these globally competitive products? That's a great question. I think that's a really it's a really big answer to that. I don't know if there's just a simple answer, but 
you know, if you talk to Chinese people about, uh, you know, I mean, if you come to, for people who listen to this who've never been to China, if you were to come to China and have a conversation about something which seems straightforward and common sense to you, it's very likely that you'll find something which will shock you with how different it is. Um, and that's just kind of how different China is. So to give you an example, I would say like when I first started working in gaming in China around 2010, we would, just to give you an example, like a hypothetical example, let's say we're working on a game that takes place in medieval Europe and we have an artist who is drawing characters which would appear in the game. Um, in many cases, these would be wildly uh, preposterous characters, which include all kinds of features that any Western person would outright laugh at. Uh, but it's not funny to them. This is just how they understand medieval European culture to be. Like what, do you, a, like, like what do you mean? Like, what uh, would like he would wrong? have like a pink hat, which looks like it's Chinese or, I mean, just wildly inaccurate interpretation of what this culture looks like. And I mean, you might see the same thing for Westerners. You know, if you ask uh, an average person on the street in America where ninjas come from, there's probably a 40% chance they'll say China. You know, a lot of this stuff is not obvious to to people because it's culture from a very far away place where they'll never go and they've never been. So it's overcoming these kind of obstacles, which China's had to do to, to find this success. I mean, we there's if you... Go to the website Reddit, for example. There are subreddits which are entirely devoted to uh, Chinese cultural misunderstandings of Western um, historical facts, uh, Western brands, uh, fake products. I mean, all kinds of distorted understandings of Western culture. And in general, this has kind of been a stereotype of China. You know, the stereotype is that China works very hard, but it just has no cultural understanding of what's going on outside of China. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because... I guess before coming here, I never really thought about Western games as being like Western in any sense. Um, but but the more I the more I think back to you know games like Civilization or um, or I mean what else has like I mean even like Starcraft Two like it seems like it's it's clear the developers were were Western and like the Space Marines are all white, um, right? So 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 kind of thinking about that from an inverted sense, it it does make sense that those those barriers would be would be hard to overcome but um you know what what's interesting and what really struck me um you know starting to to play uh, more chinese mobile apps in particular is is how they really are world beating um like wang zhirong yao in particular um which is um you know originally a a, 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 a clone of uh, league of legends but actually like is so well made and so well tailored to the to the mobile experience that there there really isn't um um, you know, the, the, the Western uh, MOBAs, these like five on five games I've played, um, don't really come close in terms of the um, in terms of the, the features and the design um, and, and what have you. So 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 coming somewhere where um, games are really viewed in a different sense is uh, has, has been really fascinating for me. So um, let's talk a little bit about. Um, the impact of the government on these uh, on the on the evolution of the gaming industry over time. So um, you know, there's there's concerts, there's there's been concert, content censorship. There's been a console ban, which is recently lifted. Um, but but how has that? Uh, how has the role of the government impacted um, the evolution of this of this industry? It's hugely impacted it. There's no area of life in China that is not impacted by the government. The government is involved in every single aspect of life in China, from economy to politics to history to games, television, music, movies, everything. So the government is involved with all of the upsides and all of the downsides of the gaming industry inside China. And also the government has a very intentional goal here, which is to make China competitive globally and also to keep foreign influence out. So as you mentioned, a lot of foreign games, when they come to China, they're censored or in some cases banned. And I think it's for a couple of different reasons, but one is to keep foreign competition outside of China. China doesn't want Chinese markets or the Chinese economy uh, deeply influenced by foreign companies. They want Chinese companies to be the successful companies inside China. So the foreign success stories, which we've mentioned already, um, StarCraft II, Over, uh, Overwatch, um, League of Legends, World of Warcraft, uh, PUBG now, all of these games have been under the stewardship of a Chinese publisher. In many cases, NetEase. NetEase and Tencent are the two largest uh, game developers and publishers inside China. 
So if a foreign game comes to China and finds success, it's basically a 100% chance that it's under the umbrella of one of these two companies. And these two companies can almost be interpreted as uh, appendages of the government itself. Both of them, by law, have members of the Chinese Communist Party on their board. Uh, and so they have to operate with the express intentions of the Chinese government in mind. So no part of this process does not involve the government. The government has to uh, give the green light to any game which they publish inside China. Um, as some listeners may know, the process for getting a game into a Chinese app store is incredibly onerous. There is a huge list of restrictions. If one of them is violated, the app will be taken off the app store immediately. And in many cases, the developer can face very severe penalties. So it's pretty different from any other market in that way, in that it's very restrictive in terms of the content. Just to give you an example of some of these rules, some of them are very vague and kind of unclear. So anything which opposes the government in any way, obviously unallowed. Uh, anything which is violent is unallowed. This rule is kind of very unclear because there are obviously a lot of successful games which are very violent inside China. Counter-Strike is one of those. Uh, PUBG, which is the latest phenomenon, which is everyone talking about, very violent as well. Um, games in China cannot include any English at all. They have to be 100% Chinese. Uh, games have been taken off of the Chinese app store, even for including buttons which say things like Go. Uh, just those two letters making the word Go is banned. <laughs> so, And the reason why they do this is because they want to make sure that foreign influence does not uh, get a strong position inside China because uh, China is very protective over its national culture. And so this type of um, restriction and censorship is not unique to the games industry. It's also present in the music industry. You may have heard that hip-hop was recently banned from television inside China. Uh, no so, musicians who appear on Chinese television can have tattoos. So it's also present in music, movies, games, basically all culture in China. So my favorite example of this was from a uh, PUBG clone that I was playing on the App Store. And one day, uh, all of a sudden in the little loading screen, uh, all these uh, propaganda banners showed up that said basically like, we're here to train to fight for our country. Um, and uh, the blood was taken, or I guess there was no blood to begin with, but um, the whole premise of it um, is that you're like playing in a VR simulation of a um, PLA army training to like protect the motherland from invasion. So, um, you know, funny, but also you, you, you see this when you play the, when you play the biggest games, which I think is, um, I think is really interesting. Another one that, that stuck out to me um, was the first time I came to try to play to a, play a video games at an internet cafe in China. Uh, they sent me, they kicked me out because I didn't have a passport uh, or an ID that could show I was over 18. Um, but then when I was in um, Taiwan recently, I walked in and there were teenagers everywhere and I felt incredibly old. Um, so, so, you know, these sorts of things really um, do end up pervading the, uh, uh, the gaming, the gaming ecosystem. Those, but let's the, rules, turn... the rules which you mentioned, just let one last thing is our, really funny because they're so preposterous as you mentioned so PUBG has been popular inside China for quite a long time now about a year and it wasn't until recently the latter half of 2017 that Tencent acquired the rights to license and publish the game inside China but before that happened there was a lot of discussion about PUBG being banned because the government made an official declaration that violent survival games in particular which PUBG is one uh, do not adhere to socialist values and so kind of no one really knows what that means. Like what is what are socialist values exactly and which socialist values does a game like PUBG really violate? Well, no one really knows. And so there was all this, all this theorizing about, well, how can PUBG possibly adhere to socialist values? I mean, it's a game about killing people to survive. So yeah, sometimes, it's, it's, I mean, sometimes you share guns with your friends if they don't have any, right? I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, people were thinking, like, do you make the blood green? Uh, do you just put up propaganda banners? Like, what do you do exactly? So it raises this question of, you know, what kind of preposterous lengths must the developer go to to get this green light? And ironically, it turns out that really not much has changed at all. I mean, the game does have uh, propaganda banners in it now, the PUBG mobile version. Um, but it's largely unchanged. So, I mean, a lot of the, this is just a general China thing. Um, a lot of preposterous rules in general. 
So you mentioned earlier the um, the Tencent Netties dynamic of these two massive publishers, um, which isn't really replicated in um, in the rest of the world markets where we have you know, still very large ones, but, um, are, are more on, are on more of a competitive market. And, um, you know, all, everyone is kind of selling through, through steam, which is a whole nother, um, can of worms we can get into, but we'll maybe save for another time. So, um, Tencent and NetEase, how does their dominance impact the, um, the, the gaming ecosystem here in China? Well, they dominate the gaming industry inside China, probably 80, percent of revenue in the game industry goes to those two companies and Tencent is quite a bit larger but it's not like anything anywhere else in the world like you describe I mean if you're in America and you think that Google has a monopoly imagine that times 10 and you're starting to get closer to how big Tencent is Tencent effectively uh, owns the entire Chinese internet basically um, and their control has just gotten more intense with the popularity of WeChat over the last five years Every single person in China uses WeChat, essentially every person with a smartphone. Um, it has well over a billion users. Uh, people now use WeChat for everything. You chat with people, you video conference with people, you buy things, uh, movie tickets, you call cars. Uh, the number of things you can do with WeChat is just absolutely mind-blowing. It's almost like an operating system in itself, which has brought about a discussion, uh, which is is there any difference between iOS and Android in China? Because everyone's just using WeChat anyway. And now WeChat has introduced many apps which function just like apps in the App Store, but there's less friction because people are already in WeChat. So we're potentially looking at a future where Tencent has far more control than it even does now. And the control that it has now is already staggering and unlike anything else. So just for instance, um, this uh, to, to kind of launch this mini app feature, they launched a um, like pretty simple jumping game where you hold down your thumb um, and then a little character jumps from one to another. And just because Tencent decided that, um, you know, it was a good game, it was fun, it was a little addictive, but like Tencent was able to make this a, a national phenomenon mm-hmm. um, in, way, in a way that no other um, company could do just out of, out of thin air like that. Um, one Tencent, of the, one makes, of... Tencent makes phenomenons like every week. They can do it whenever they want. They can take any game. They can buy any game from anyone because their their money is essentially unlimited. They can buy anything. Uh, and they can push it to hundreds of millions of people at any time they want. And they're also very smart. You know, they, Obviously, they're not going to push something which they think will be ineffective. They're very good at picking what games and what applications you know, fit the, the palette of China. And so League of Legends is a great example. So League of Legends was developed outside China. China knew that it had potential inside China. They bought the developer, Riot, outright, and they published the game inside China. It's it's seen incredible growth inside China in esports and among casual players. They've successfully adapted that game to mobile with Wang Rongyao and other games which are like that mobile games, the MOBA genre. And now League of Legends is interpreted correctly as an Asian game. It's more a Chinese game now than it is a Western game. And that transition has been completely under Tencent's uh, stewardship. So let's talk a little bit about uh, consumer habits alongside the different industry um, dynamics there the you know you know Chinese people themselves uh, have different have a different you know gaming has a different place in Chinese culture than it may um, in the in the US right now so um, what I don't know where, where do you want to go from that what have you seen um, in terms of in terms of user base and, and consumption of games that uh, that surprised you over the years so there are more gamers inside China than anywhere else uh, there are more people inside China than there are anywhere else so those there's obviously correlation between those two things. Console gaming, you know, exists, but only really as a gray market. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, it wasn't until very recently that China allowed legally the sales of consoles inside China, and they've only allowed that under very strict rules in how they can be sold and what kind of functionality and features they can include. But legal consoles in China have kind of gone nowhere. Uh, so the primary platform for games is mobile. Uh, PC games are very popular in chi- inside China as well. Um, many people play those inside internet bars, Wampas, which you mentioned. But mobile is pulling away from every other platform in terms of games. And this is kind of a global phenomenon. As phones get uh, cheaper, faster, more powerful, uh, 
uh, people are playing more and more games on mobile just because there's a lot less friction there. So you can download an app on your phone. Most games are free. Most of them use uh, a free-to-play business model to get a wider user base. So it's just easier for people to play games on their phones. And also, games on phones are like becoming serious rivals to console games now. And that's been a development which we've seen just in the last couple of years. So a lot of games on mobile now are competent rivals to PC games, even complex PC games, which traditionally were thought to not even work on mobile. And so MOBA is a good example of that. So uh, MOBA is an acronym which stands for Multiplayer Online Battle Arena Game. So these are games of action games of territorial control. Uh, so League of Legends is one of these. So it was conventional thought says that this type of game doesn't work on a phone because you need precise control over your character and you can only get that kind of precision with a mouse and keyboard. Well, Tencent figured out how to do that on mobile and they did it very well. And in the process, they created literally the most popular game of all time, which is Wander Royale. I mean, what's what's been striking to me uh, is is just the prevalence of this game. And, you know, if you're with your coworkers and you have 20 minutes of downtime, it's a way to bond. Um, it, it, it is really everywhere. And one of the other striking things, um, which, which I've noticed, is the prevalence of uh, females gaming in China. I think the user base of Wang Zhong Yao is, is right about 50%, um, a 50%, uh, a 50-50 gender split. Um, so, Polly, maybe if you want to um, comment on on the kind of lack of stigma, um, which which may which you may see more of the West with regards to, to females in gaming. Um, I'm not that familiar with like female <laughs> gaming in the West, so probably I won't do a very like um, good like comparison. But I could talk about like female gaming in in China. So I think especially for like the the games which has a lot of like social networking or like a lot of interactions between the players then the female players will like prefer this kind of games because they're not really like play games they really want to make friends from the games and they kind of like care more about probably like the the story so like uh, like the games that we are developing is like MMO RPG games, mm-hmm. and we have like done like a survey on like different players. We found out the females like care more about the stories and um, has like a higher set- satisfaction percent about the, the stories, and they care more about like our outfits or like the the like the images or like the um, art quality of the games etc so um in recent years with like development of technology i think the game developers try to like especially the chinese developers they try to like improve the quality of their games and which attracts more like female players and there's also an atmosphere in like the chinese probably gaming circle that because the male players are still like the domi Dated the people so if they they found out oh like my another player is female it will be nice to them so like we're finding well like the, at least xiao jie jie or oh, because they are using like yy to talk about each other and found out oh this is a female and they will like become like more happy it's like, kind of a stereotype as well so like um be, um, be nice to the female which still um not that like gender equality but still like the female player kind of get more benefits from this kind of uh, atmosphere so probably it will make the female players be more interested in playing the games yeah i think the the dominant um uh response you see um in 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 articles and online as a female player on on western servers is not nearly as positive i mean that's still like an odd gender gen, it's a very it's still a very gendered reaction right mm-hmm. but um the the community is is certainly much more forbidding i think than it is in in china and the um the community aspect of um of wang zhe rong yao um and other games is really is really apparent if you go in the apps because they're integrated with wechat which is like this um chat function that everyone uses in china um on the right side of the screen you see all of your friends um, and you can invite them to play with you. Yeah. Uh, the whole the whole point of this game, which was um, which was and still is enormous here, is that it is um, it is something you're supposed to do together with your friends, um, not not something you're gonna like 
you know shoot alone for your your best score um and and that dynamic is something that i think these um uh, a lot of chinese game developers have really been able to um to to latch on to 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 help spread their games and make them uh make them more popular thoughts charlie yeah i agree with everything you said um there is a (laughs) there is a split in terms of gender i think there are more female players than there are male players at this point because what mobile games has really done has dramatically expanded the user base of casual players in particular so there are i mean when i was a kid there were not a lot of games which were uh, popular with girls my age but now there are a lot of games which are incredibly popular with women of all ages starting at five years old up to grandmothers who are playing candy crush so there's a huge assortment of casual games which appeal to broad ranges of the demographic spectrum of Chinese society and global society as well. So one of the biggest factors in this explosion of the gaming industry is the fact that people of all backgrounds have some game which they're interested in. And most people have some game which they play on their phones. Uh, in recent years, like mobile games like intendedly targeted uh, to the female players. So like probably two months ago, a very popular mobile game called like Love and Producer. In China, it can, it's very, it was very popular, but it not, it's not that popular probably after two months, but in the beginning. And it's intended to the female players because your like, ambition in these games is to date with di- uh, four different males. And they have like different characters, and all very handsome, and you have like different stories in, the, in it. And what you do in the games, like a date with these people and talk to them and like, and you are also like a producer of a company, and you will make some like TV programs. So it's very like targeted to the heterosexual females, and they're really very willing to pay money for these games. And probably like several years ago, there's another game um, produced by the same company as this one. So like, they are like um, their business is mostly the female player games, and what that game called TT Nuan Nuan is just like change the clothes and they make a lot of like different beautiful clothes for the female especially female players to choose and you could buy it and like have a different styles etc et so this is like very like intentionally to yeah. like the female players market and what they and I think they learned from the Japanese uh, game companies mostly this type of game which you describe which is monetized by in-app purchases usually to customize uh, a player or a virtual space like a room uh, has a much longer history in east asia than it does anywhere else on the planet so there's a long history that china has with these uh, an economy of these kind of purchases which is a kind of unique area of expertise that china has china is particularly good at monetizing precisely these types of games and the popularity of this business model inside China has spread globally. And now the free-to-play in-app purchase business model is the predominant one in the App Store. Uh, but it started in China first because in the 1990s or in the 2000s, before the App Store even existed, uh, it wasn't really possible to sell games to Chinese users uh, outright because piracy was such a rampant issue. Um, if a developer tried to sell a game for 50 or $60 as you would in the United States, they would just pirate the game and you'd find it for 20 RMB at a local market. So it was not a sustainable business model for Chinese game developers to use. So they very quickly adapted uh, and kind of developed this in-app purchase model. Um, And so it's been popular in China for a very long time. When I first came to China, everyone was using QQ. This was before WeChat existed. And one part of QQ. QQ was similar to WeChat uh, in that it's also run by Tencent, but it had a sprawling feature set. It had all kinds of different areas of the service to do you know, many different things, just like WeChat. If you make a chart of everything WeChat does, it's like hundreds of things. QQ is similar. One of the things which I thought was really interesting was QQ Kongjian, which uh, I'm sure you guys know what it is, but for anyone who doesn't, it's basically a virtual room where you have an avatar Um, And you can customize every aspect of the avatar. So you can dress them up in special clothes. You can change its hair. You can 
change the wallpaper, the room that it's in. You can add furniture. And a lot of these changes necessitated a purchase using real money. And it was actually a big economy of purchases within this virtual marketplace. At the time that this was popular inside China, if you had tried to popularize this business model in the West, it wouldn't work because people would look at these kind of purchases as ridiculous. Why would you spend real money on a virtual rug in your you know, virtual room connected to your social media application? There was just no precedent of these types of, of purchases, and it was just something which there was no cultural compatibility. So China has had a long history with this type of uh, behavior and this type of uh, virtual goods marketplace. And what what's important to to understand now is is this has really come back to the West, and now you see um, people spending hundreds of dollars on on uh, skins for their guns to make them look cooler in the games or whatever else. So Polly, what was in your uh, cuckoo Kong Jen? Um, I didn't do many things. So <laughs> Kong Jen, yeah, but I do, I do did something for my cuckoo pets. Okay. So, I have like the function of the cuckoo pass as like a penguin. So the penguin is like the icon of the Tencent. And you could, so it's like something like we're standing in your like on your laptop and you could see it and you could fit it, like take a shower and et cetera. I do play games with it, et cetera. And you could like uh, let it marry to another penguin and they will have babies, et cetera. <laughs> and it was very popular when I was like primary school students and I even asked one of my because you need to like buy to you need to pay and to buy a penguin but at that time I wasn't have I didn't have like money to do that so I asked him, uh, one of my classmates because she uh, has a penguin and got married and had a baby so I asked she to give this ba- baby to me and this <laughs> become like like my first cuckoo pass but uh, this pass not popular anymore after like the 10 years yeah. that's really funny that's a good story i'm yeah, i had and- a cuckoo con gen i made it as preposterous as i could just to try to parody the whole system and then mm-hmm. i remember like my avatar had like spiky hair and had like a leather jacket with glitter on it and chinese friends would see it and they'd be like oh your avatar is like oh. really cool like i really like what you've done <laughs> yeah. and no no perception that it was was a joke um but this is the cultural difference well there you go um, so just circling back to one of the one of the one of the points you made earlier, Polly, I tried that uh, that love and producers game, oh, yeah. and um, it was too hard for me uh, <laughs> because I can't read Chinese well enough. Um, a lot of the other games, I've been able to kind of work my way through the menu slowly and figure out how it works. Um, but you know, you were you were speaking earlier about how um, you know the focus of uh, in story on story mm-hmm. and, and and appealing to a female audience in China. Um, this one had a bit too much story for me to actually mm. understand what was going on. Um, but maybe, maybe, maybe the next girls' game six months from now, my my reading will be good enough to uh, <laughs> to to find a boyfriend. Um, so let's turn a little bit to uh, esports in China, which is a which is a huge deal. I was in a mall uh, randomly and saw a FIFA online tournament, which I. Um, do not recommend. It's not a great spectator sport. Um, but um, the uh, the amount of uh, competitive gaming that's that's going on here, I think, uh, far exceeds any other um, country in the world. Um, the 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 other funny thing I saw streamed online was actually a mobile game competition where. Um, you know, usually on these things, you see people uh, behind computers. But in this in this competition, these guys were like holding phones hunched over in front of an arena of 30,000 people, which, you know, I guess to me sounds preposterous. But maybe five years from now is going to be the norm. Um, so, Charlie, you want to talk a little bit about this this industry and the, and the impact and feedback loop it has on uh, on, on game development and uh, and these and the popularity of these games? Yeah, I think the forebear of of the popularity of esports in China is South Korea. So for a long time, for over 10 years, esports has been sort of a stadium filling affair in South Korea. And now we see the same thing in China and we're moving towards that direction in international markets as well, including the United States. Uh, Clash of Clans, which is the incredibly popular mobile game developed by Supercell, which Tencent owns a huge part of, uh, based in Helsinki, Finland. They just recently announced within the last week um, that they are hosting a major international esports 
tournaments, which invites players from around the world to compete in online matches to win a position in this real world uh, competition, which happens in a in a stadium, presumably. So we're, this is definitely an international phenomenon. But inside China, it's incredibly huge. It's very big with League of Legends in particular. Um, I had a girlfriend who I was with for a long time who was a fanatical League of Legends fan. And she would not just play the game a lot, but she would watch the game a lot. And this is something you notice, which is very popular inside China, is just to watch uh, League of Legends. A lot of people don't even play the game much. They just watch it. So they're eating lunch and they're watching people play League of Legends. Um, South Park parodied this uh, pop- the popularity of this uh, this practice in an episode, which was great, where um, they're all just watching PewDiePie play games and observers are wondering, well, why wouldn't you want to play the game? Why are you just watching other people play? But this kind of behavior is extremely common inside China. So the League of Legends competitions in particular are televised on TV. They have millions of viewers in internet live streams and in general are just major events which accrue an incredible amount of attention um, from a lot of people who are just casual viewers as well. So in Europe or like in Germany, for example, people watch football. In China, they watch League of Legends. And it's really strange for me to see because... I've been deeply involved with the game industry for a long time. League of Legends is a game I've played, but it's not really a game that I'm into. And so for me to observe all of this fervor around observing observing League of Legends is kind of amazing. It's kind of a difficult game to watch also, you know? If you watch FIFA, for example, I don't find that very exciting either. But at least I know, like, what's going on. Like, those are the football players, there's the ball, there's the goal. It's all pretty easy to understand. League of Legends, however, there's all kinds of stuff going on, which I have no idea what's going on. There's magical spells going off all the time. There's items being used. There are dozens or hundreds of different heroes inside League of Legends, all of which have their own unique uh, abilities and qualities and such. So it's a pretty complex thing to follow. Um, So it's just a totally different culture for me. Uh, but it's rapidly expanding. I mean, you're starting to see more games achieve this kind of success. You're starting to see more games uh, accrue a lot of viewers. And uh, you start to see it a lot in China. I mean, if you buy like a Coke, you know, you might see League of Legends on the side of it. Um, you might see billboards for a lot of these games. This is really mainstream appeal at this point. So my parents didn't understand why I watch video games uh, either. So let me just do a little pressy um, on 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 the potential appeal. Um, so you know, definitely for certain games, there's there's some time investment that you have to do to understand. You know, soccer is sort of intu- intuitive, but American football, Ganlancio isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but but once you um, once you do put your time in, I mean, one of the really cool things about watching a video game um, is. For you, it's a game of perfect information. You know exactly what's going on, but the players don't. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like watching poker on TV um, where, like, you know who's going to win, but you don't know who's going to bet and if they're going to bet right or wrong or if they're betting stupidly. Um, But with with esports, you know, this is happening in real time, and the amount of variables and the amount of decisions that all these players are making um, is far exceeds, um, you know, bet, uh, uh, you know, raise, uh, check, or fold. Um, so, so that um, that tension of knowing more than the players do is something that can, that that potential that you know normal sports uh, you don't really get to see, and and something that I think is really um, re- really makes the, the viewing experience uh, uh, fascinating. Um, I'm going to shout out one other um, or my favorite uh, iteration of esports in China. It's called Robo Masters. I don't know if you've um, come across this, Polly or, or Charlie, but I like the sound G- of it. So JDI, which is the um, the biggest drone maker in the world, um, sponsors this competition every year um, that has uh, college kids and graduate students all over the country make like university teams. Cool. And basically it's a sort of robotic league of legends mm-hmm. um, in that each of the robots has different, um, you know, they these are, these are, you know, like two foot by two foot robots um, and the players control them and they kind of move them around and they have to shoot balls into different things and they're like fighting. Um, it's not it's not like a it's not like a uh, one of those like robot shows where the robots blow each other up um, but it's still very um, 
like very fascinating to watch and uh, and really cool uh, in a really cool way. I think um, that a that a Chinese company is um, getting people interested in um, in engineering and technology. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, YouTube ro- YouTube or, or um, uh, uh, you know Yoku ro- Robo Masters. It's worth uh, it's worth twenty minutes of your time. Uh, so uh, that sounds sounds cool, but I know nothing about it. So. Do they like control the robots and to play like League of Legends games? Or- so, so it has its own. It, it's it's kind of the same concept as League of Legends, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, the there are like five five people who are controlling robots um, from each team, and they're. Um, and they'll be like battling each other, mm-hmm. um, shooting different these like little ping pong balls mm-hmm. at the different at different targets and stuff. Um, I'll definitely throw a link up in the uh, in the show notes. So um, before we before we wrap up, you did mention earlier, Charlie, about your um, DJing experience in uh, in China, and I'm I'm curious if you could uh, talk a little bit about how you think the club scene has evolved since you've um, since you've since you've made it out here. Yeah, well, let's see. The club scene has certainly evolved. I've been here a long time. I mean, the the club scene internationally has evolved in general. I would say in China, it probably hasn't developed as much as I thought it would, or as much as I hoped it would. Um, a lot of places tout cities in China, especially Shanghai, as like truly global cities in terms of DJ culture. Um, I don't think that that's the case. I think that China still has a long way to go to develop that. But um, there are a lot of people in China interested in music. There are a lot of clubs in China. Um, when I first started DJing in China, when I first came here, I had already been DJing for six years with vinyl and turntables in the United States. And so that had a sort of niche appeal when I arrived in China. Um, I think that that still has kind of a niche appeal here, to be honest. But a lot of the the club scene is dominated by um, sort of gimmicks in China, I would say. Um, And at the time when I first arrived in China, I think like I, you know, me as a DJ in China was like kind of a gimmick in itself. Um, at the time, this was from 2005 until 2007 or so. And so at that time, I was flying around the country and kind of like, you know, white guy on stage scratching on a turntable. And like people were just really excited to see that because that was something which they had never seen before. So there is kind of a lot of novelty in the Chinese music scene in general. Um, and there's not so much of that in the West just because the DJ scene has so much more experience and has so much more history. So you won't get on stage in the United States just because you look a certain way, almost without exception. Um, And China's, to its credit, becoming less like that. So there is a greater degree of authenticity in the music scene in China now than there was in years past. But um, I still think it has a long way to develop. So I don't know I don't know how it how it is in Chengdu, but the um, the Beijing scene, um, the the vast majority of these clubs have very small dance floors actually, which is something that came to as surprises me. Basically, um, over the you know square footage of um, a club, you know eighty plus percent of it will be for tables. And um, from from what I've seen, the 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 socializing um, between different um, uh, friend groups who show up together is like nearly non-existent. Basically, you come with your ten friends or so, and you hang out with them all night, and then um, and then it sort of ends. Whereas, um, you know, there's there's I think two um, two venues in in Beijing that have a bit of a different um, vibe that I personally was more familiar with, where there's you know an open dance floor, and the idea is different people are going to be um, meeting new. Um, meeting new folks is this something you've in, you've encountered or I imagine this is something you've encountered as well Charlie in your um uh, in your in your musical adventures yeah but I want to know which of the two venues is it Dada and Lantern or what so there is Dada and then there's a new one okay in, in any case yeah I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about obviously um the the Chinese style of club is one that I don't find fun I actually find really boring and uninteresting um, as you describe it's generally People kind of just go there for face. People kind of just go there for face um, and to sort of realism. So what is common in major Chinese cities is outside clubs, you'll find Lamborghinis and Ferraris parked out front. And then inside, you'll find uh, wealthy guys who are just buying bottles of the most expensive thing they can find, who are surrounded by sycophantic friends or romantic interests. So it's not really about the music at all in those cases. And that's why there's no dance floor because 
no one's there to dance. Um, people generally aren't there to meet people, which is why people come with their own crowd and tend to stick with that. So they don't really meet new people either. Um, these kind of clubs are incredibly smoky and uh, frequently feature vomiting outside of them. So in general, just not places where I like to hang out. I'm actually not even a big drinker, um, but the clubs where I would DJ in China are like the opposite of that. Um, they're much more like Dada, which is a club that I've played at several times. I don't really want to close on a super negative note. So let's um, turn to China, Chinese hip hop, which, um, you know, has its issues. But I found a, uh, you know, fascinating and, and invigorating scene, um, which I've really been enjoying exploring over the past over the past, uh, you know, over the past year or so. Um, so Chengdu is definitely one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the centers in China for that. Um, how, how has uh, watching uh, the Chinese rap scene mature over time uh, been for you, Charlie? Really exciting. One of the most interesting areas of Chinese music in general, uh, probably the most interesting area, I would say, is hip hop. And Chengdu is widely perceived to be the capital of Chinese hip hop. And I think that that is an accurate look at the picture. Chengdu musicians are very well known um, internationally as well as inside China. And moreover, Chengdu is kind of known as um, cultural capital, might be too strong um, of a word to use, but a very cultural city in general. Um, Chengdu is known for its gaming industry, known for music, known for art. There's a lot of painters and uh, traditional artists who come from Chengdu and gaming culture in general, Chinese chess, Go, things like that. So, But to talk about hip hop specifically, it's been very exciting. Um, I Hip hop is my uh, main interest in terms of DJing. Um, I've been a hip hop DJ for the entirety of my time in China. And so I've gotten to deeply know a lot of rappers in particular and uh, my best friend in China is a rapper who's one of the best um, hip hop musicians in China who I strongly recommend everyone to check out his name is Kafe Hu um, so it's been so exciting I think because expression is such a sensitive area inside China um, controls on expression are incredibly rigid inside China and hip hop presents this incredible opportunity for Chinese youth to express themselves in a way that can't be controlled so easily because good rappers, first of all, are communicating real things. They're not just talking about nonsense um, like fake gangster stories or cars or just materialistic nonsense. Um, they're talking about actual social issues, which is what hip hop was created to do. So real Chinese rappers do that. And it's just a really fascinating thing to, to learn and to see, you know, what people think, how they feel about their environment, how they feel about society, um, how they feel about their place in the world. And I feel that hip hop in China is one of the few places where you can actually feel this and experience this because you can't just write a book about how you feel. Uh, if you touch on any sensitive areas, you can't publish a website which says how you feel if it touches upon any sensitive areas. And there are a lot of restrictions like that. So this is why I think that hip hop has a unique place inside China in particular. Um, whereas if you're in Germany or France, sure, you can express yourself through hip hop, but you can express yourself in a number of different ways. So hip hop is not unique in that way. Um, so to close, maybe if we could get, uh, aside from Cafe Who, two more, um, two more rappers you enjoy, and then my selfish question. So I am um, on the hunt for fully voiced Mandarin games uh, to practice my Chinese. Um, chatting on uh, PUBG squads is fun, but ma but maybe there's a maybe there's another a more developed way to for me to get at that. So if you have a if you want to uh, close out this episode with some uh, with some shout outs, that'd be uh, that'd be great. Yeah. So my favorite two rappers inside China, uh, one is Cafe Hu, who I mentioned. The other one is a frequent collaborator whose name's Xiao Lao Hu, who's actually from uh, Beijing. Um, his name is Little Tiger, I guess. It sounds weird when you translate it to English. But he is a, sort of a psychedelic rapper, I guess. Um, he has a very poetic style. Um, it's it's uh, often very imaginative, unconventional hip-hop. So I really like him. Um, another producer who these two frequently work with is named Soul Speak. And he is... Uh, in America and in Beijing. I think he's 
lives half the time in Beijing and half the time in Los Angeles. Spends a lot of time in Beijing, though. So, Cafe uh, Hu, Soul Speak, and Xiaolao Hu are the three people who I'd recommend musically. Um, as far as games with voiced Chinese, it's hard for me to think of something that I can really recommend. And actually, I would probably be pretty reluctant to recommend that in general. Um, but there are a lot of games which are good to learn Chinese with, and. I think that uh, games in Steam are particularly good for this. A lot of international developers are localizing their games into uh, simplified and traditional Chinese because Steam is now a relevant platform inside mainland China because of the popularity of PUBG. So one of these games in particular, which I really love and which is localized in Chinese, is Undertale, which is an independent game which is not that text-heavy and has pretty simple. Um, language in the game. It's an independent game developed by a single person named Toby Fox, and it's a really good game and good for good for improving your Chinese. But it's not spoken Chinese; it's just written Chinese. Cool. And and with that, I think we'll we'll call it an episode. Charlie, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time today. Paul, you were fantastic as a guest host. Hope to have uh, both of you two guys back soon. Thanks very much. I appreciate it.